I will follow a plan. Uh, pl I will follow a plan that will take me to, I'm not going to spend too much time defining professionalism. I'm going to go into the context of it. I was also asked to um, speak of uh, the current situation, the status quo of professionalism in Africa on the continent without, of course, coming back to what has already been said in my book. And then there afterwards, what are the lessons learned and what are the good practices? And how do we ensure that all of this can be shared? And I will review some ideas and allow Professor Wani to also provide things in a more general way. So in the next 20 minutes, I will review the definition. I prefer not really defining professionalism because it, it opposes itself to amateurism. But within the military context, when we speak of professionalism, I, when we speak, I used to be in error, but it's how can an army take tanks, take guns, go in the fee on the uh, in the theater and uh, undertake operational work. So it goes beyond that professionalism. Those were my initial ideas, because professionalism respects principles, four principles, and these four principles are first off the subordination of defense and security forces to democratic civilian authority is a principal premise. To, there are actually five principles, not four, but the first principle is the subordination of the defense and security forces to democratic civilian authority. The second principle is the allegiance to rule of law and to the political state, the allegiance to rule of law and the political state. Dr. Kat and General Kuali uh, came, uh, spoke extensively on that. The third principle is the ethical, ethical commitment to uh, political neutrality, ethical institutional culture. And then also the know-how. This is when we speak of uh, capacities, competencies, operational skills. So when we speak of military professionalism, we have to think of these four principles. Otherwise, we may miss out on understanding what it means. These principles are integrated into values that characterize professionalism. And I think that yesterday when Dr. Nancy asked, what are the attributes, the characteristics of of leadership, you gave more than 20 answers. And these attributes uh, respond to certain values of a professional army, discipline, integrity, honor, engagement, uh, disinterested service, and the spirit of sacrifice and duty. So it is important to understand why we have established, said that these values mean you are a professional soldier. So the value system for mil the in military institution means that the military institution is out of the ordinary and cannot really be compared with the other branches of the state. So if you look at the other institutions, I don't think there is a, a a profession where they are asked that a value for that institution means they have to sacrifice their life to give their blood uh, to protect the population of a country. So this means that the profession of uh, working in the security sector means that you, you're in a different type of profession. 
But please keep in mind that everything I'm saying is a concept uh, that is somewhat inspired by the Western model uh, in terms of civil military relations. Uh, for example, um, Colonel Tim uh, Mitchell yesterday talked a little bit about this. But this context inspired by the Western world can only prosper in a democratic context. You cannot ask a, an army under an authoritarian or dictatorship uh, regime to accept these principles and these values. So I will not talk again about these four principles because we've we've already talked about it. But in terms of the subordination of the armed forces to a civilian authority, the civilian authority, which was democratically uh, elected, represents and is the sovereignty of an entire people. It is the sovereignty of a country which has decided to place um, certain individual individuals in a position where they will um, control the future of a country. And so this legitimately and democratically elected uh, government gives the political guidelines for all the institutions within the government, including the military institution. And the military institution, in turn, must indeed take its orders from this authority and implement its policies in this field. Because those who are democratically elected propose a, a project for society, um, which is essentially stated within policies. So the Minister of Defense, uh, who reports to the, this legitimately elected president, um, you know, receives these instructions and, and the military implements this, that in no case should these roles ever be reversed. And we feel that, you know, it's, it, many people think these values came from the West, from outside. But I will say that even in our ancient kingdoms, when you look at the empire of Mali, the empire of Mali, uh, the Malian empire, um, uh, with uh, King Keita, it was composed of kingdoms. Within these kingdoms, you will see that the various kings um, swore allegiance to the king and to the emperor. And this was so since the 15th century. Since the 15th century, they had to swear allegiance to the emperor Sunjata. Sunjata, son of Sogolon, from now on, I will take my kingdom from you, for I recognize you as my sovereign. My tribe and I are getting back or putting ourselves within your hands. I greet you, Supreme Leader. I greet you, Fama. Fama means king. So this is not a new concept. Um, swearing allegiance, subordinating your authority to a democratically elected um, civilian government is not a new Western value. This is something that has existed for a long time on our continent. Now, uh, the rule of law, Kat already spoke of rule of law, and there's not a lot more to add. But what we must keep in mind is that uh, rule of law and political authority are extremely important points. You know, I will talk about the current status of things uh, because now, we, you know, we currently see a militarization of the political world and a politicization of the military world. I will come back to this particular topic. The third principle is professional ethics. And this joins up with moral values, these moral values which are deteriorating in some of our countries. I often say the army is the reflection of society. You won't see a country where there is good governance and and the the army is usually in sync with society. 
and its governance. So in terms of the military profession, the last bulk work is in any nation is the army. It is the last defense because Machiavelli, who in his book, The Prince, I don't know if you read it, says that the state is first of all a law, an army, and an army and laws, an army and laws. These are the two essential components. And as um, Ms. Kelly says, it's like the rule of law and good governance. And Machiavelli already said this in the 15th century. So all that to say that, so if the army and the laws no longer exist, this country could uh, disappear into oblivion. This is the very, a uh, foundation on which we rely. This is why we must talk about ethics and we must really emphasize it within the sec security sector because it is a, a pillar that holds the whole structure of the nation together. So when you see uh, corruption within the security sector, for me, that's a crime because this really impacts national security. And we have countries such as mine when we order helicopters during a full-on terrorist crisis, uh, it, helicopters that will leave Ukraine or Russia and that will arrive, and then they'll do an inaugural flight the next day. And that's it. That's the end of the mission. This helicopter will just sit there, will no longer fly. You know why? Because it's obsolete material. You, you know, it was just a question of it it was essentially a um fraudulent uh purchase and it was money that was spent at the same time that people died on the front lines and had not enough munitions to fight so so we really uh, need to bring these people to justice so the know-how, which is the last point, which is operational capacity. And this is linked to corruption and a bad governance of the security sector. This brings us to what we see within our countries today, the fight against terrorism, because you will see, you know, uh, uh, 10 good for nothings on motorcycles with AK-47s who go around and traumatize an entire population. That's what's happening. And we are not in a position to arrest them. You know, it's true that in the beginning, these terrorists had these uh, armadas that came from the um, weapons store, store of Libya. But now, you know, it's good for nothing. It's on motorcycles. They go around. They go in a village. They do what they want. They kidnap who they want. They take cattle. They take girls. And then they go away. And we're not able to stop them. And this is what is important in professionalism. Uh, so all of this is going to bring me to my second point. So I'm going to go over three points. First, I will talk about civil military relations without going too far into this topic. Then I will talk about the politicization of the security and defense forces. And I'll talk about coup d'etats if we have time, because we may not have enough time. Uh, Kat is looking at her watch. Okay, civil military relations. Since uh, our country's independence in the 60s, uh, there have been coup d'etats. They were uh, trendy almost, and there were so many of them. And I think, yeah, you know, it's been a very tumultuous history of civil military relations in, in Africa over this period. And we understand that the politicization of the security and defense forces and the militarization of the political world, there's this relationship between both worlds. As I said, this is this is the part that we see. Because the problem, what is it? The political 
um, politicians are in their favorite area. But when there is interference from the military, this becomes more complicated. Uh, you can have you know certain shenanigans that take place, but the military should stay outside of all this. Unfortunately, we increasingly defense forces openly um, intervening in the political arena. And we see an increasing number of politicians who are becoming uh, even more military than the military. And this leads to coup d'etats. And uh, you'll see the coup that happened in Mali, in Burkina Faso, in Guinea. These were coups carried out by the special forces. So I need to talk about it. Special forces. These are forces that have been equipped, that have been trained to fight terrorism. But unfortunately, the, it is these special forces that undertook these coup d'etats. Before that, it was presidential guards, but now it's special forces that uh, undertake these coups. So we really need to think about this because they are better equipped, better trained. At, but unfortunately, the trend has reversed. And if we look at the situation for coup d'etats at the moment, uh, we will realize that we'll have over 108 coup d'etats um, that re succeeded and 115 coup d'etats that failed. And so when you look at this around the independence years, there were a lot of coups, um, whether successful or not. There were so many coups that were uh, successful and there were just as many that failed around independence and then until the end of the cold war and after the end of the cold war there were successful and failed coups i mean they became uh, there was a slowdown of coups during the cold war until now where you can see and, you know, you will see the rankings of countries per coup d'etat. Um, so you will see that countries like Sudan, Sudan, it's not an accident that, you know, we see what's happening in Sudan right now. They have a tradition of coups since independence. And we talk, when we talk about the number of coups, they're, they're the champions in Africa. They're the first in first place in in. And as was explained yesterday by Susan, you know, they've arrived uh, at a point when they just, it's not even a, it's a battle to the death now. It, it's not even a, a coup anymore. And where the country is torn apart and uh, in a definitive manner. Now, Burkina Faso, which you see in the middle there, my country, is uh, the number one in terms of successful coups. In Burkina, we've never had a failed coup. They all succeed. Uh, you know, that is not a good record, but it means that the military are trained to carry out coups. Now, I'll say it's coups are not the most difficult thing. It's really how you manage things afterwards that poses a problem. And this brings me to the uh, resurgence of coups in Western Africa. So in West Africa, this is a part of Africa where we've had a huge number of coups. Unfortunately, these coups are having a very negative impact on this region. We know eight coups since 2019 and uh, and out of those six successful ones and two that failed out of those eight. So that's the uh, situation, a very dark situation. So we can't talk about coup d'etats without talking about the violation of constitutions, because this is what's what underlines some of these coups at times. And, and this continues to, to feed the debates that take place in many countries and, and fragilizes them. Um, we heard the president of Ghana last year, who did the opening keynote uh, for this um, seminar last year. And who said since 2015, he was quoting uh, ACSS, there were 
15 African presidents that were extending their terms beyond the limits of the Constitution. 40, over 40 countries had adopted this term limit, but as of today, only 20 are still adhering to these term limits. So unfortunately, this is not a unique situation on the continent. We must therefore find solutions. So this situation impacts the chain of command. It brings problems from the top to the bottom, bottom to top. It's conflict between the different sectors of security, etc. And finally, the second point on which I will speak, it was said yesterday by General Puta and Joel also will mention it next week, the lack of vision, the lack of proper orientation and guidance of, of identification of our threats are impacting the professionalism of our armies. And to make this work, there are the laws of pro programming laws within the military. We are, if we look at um, Anglophone countries, what do they call military programmation? It, this allows the army to have a three to five year budget in a in a flowing way to be able to purchase material. This is a good plan. This is good planning. But there have to be in place instruments that can do the follow through and can have the oversight, as was mentioned, uh, the oversight, democratic oversight of all of these expenses and purchases. So there is uh, money put into the budget, but there's no, no mechanisms of follow through. And in countries where there was uh, these issues, um, the min ministries of defense have been put into prison because they were given huge budgets and large amounts of money and they just spent it on their own. So for themselves. So we have institutions we, the military, do not even uh, respond to the instructions of the defense minister at times. They just, he just, it's very important, therefore, to understand even the minister of the defense does not really uh, get involved uh, with some of the military issues for, this is not normal. So this is a problem, and I think there's a session that deals with this, which is the management of resources within the security sector. There are many countries who uh, have come out of coup d'etat, for example, Nigeria, Ghana, with really um, the, uh, in Nigeria, it's, this was in the past, but unfortunately in some countries, like Burkina, Mali, and Guinea, and what has ha happened in Senegal, uh, we need to really raise awareness. And so when the military take power, the first thing they say is the army saw the situation and decided to take matters in their own hands. But what must be done? I think we have to really professionalize the armed forces. I have one minute, so I'm going to very quickly uh, pass through this. So I believe that we must... I'm going to allow Professor Wally to come back in depth on some of these, but we must uh, depoliticize the security sector environment. And sometimes we have, in some uh, barracks, there's a sign up that civilians are not allowed. No, no, that is not correct. We must depoliticize the security sector. We also need to institutionalize ethics and accountability. 
there must be accountability of the monies that are used and we need to put into place, we need to establish independent oversight mechanisms. It is also very important to strengthen parliamentary oversight and that the parliament plays its roles. Uh, this is very important. And we also need to strengthen the professional training. And so in so many persons have spoken of this. But what is interesting is, is arriving at the reforms of the security sector and strengthening training and professional education to ensure the security of the country. Thank you.